Hey there, this is Ron Pereira from the Gemba Academy, and uh, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar that's going to be focused on creating a workplace people love by adding joy. So a little bit about Gemba Academy. So we are producers of online and DVD-based Lean and Six Sigma training videos. As of today, we have over 700 videos, and it's constantly growing. Uh, our subscriptions are a bit unique in that uh, we, we work on a site-based model, which means to say that if you have a facility with 500 people, you need one subscription and all 500 people can access the, uh, the learning content. And we also have uh, uh, subscriptions for individuals, and if you have multiple sites, we can, uh, we can work with you as well. Now, we have a very popular three-day trial where people can come on and, and, and kick the tires and uh, take us for a test drive, no strings attached. Um, so go to GembaAcademy.com if you're interested in, in getting set up with that. Okay, so now let me go ahead and, uh, and introduce uh, today's presenter. From kid programmer in 1971 to Forbes cover story in 2003, Joy Inc. author Richard Sheridan has never shied from challenges, opportunities, or the limelight. And while his focus has always been around technology, his passion is actually process, teamwork, and organizational design with one ultimate goal, the business value of joy. Now, Richard graduated from the University of Michigan with a BS in computer science and an MS in computer engineering. And I just have to say, I have met uh, Richard and his team there in, uh, in Michigan, and uh, it is without a doubt one of the most fantastic places and most fantastic cultures that I've ever experienced. So um, I'm super excited to have Richard on the, uh, the webinar here today. So without further ado, Richard, I'll just go ahead and turn things over to you, and I will be back at the end uh, to facilitate uh, Q&A. Thanks so much, Ron. It's great to be here, and I love the fact that I get to connect with your audience. Because I imagine uh, much like I did at one point in my career, uh, there are a lot of people who are trying to imagine a different kind of workplace, perhaps reinventing the one they already have, uh, like I did in the earliest part of my career. And you know, when I stop people, especially at conferences where I give keynotes and talks, and I ask them to imagine a place that uh, they would like to work one day, that they could create it exactly the way they wanted it, and they could describe it in just one word. Uh, I pose that question to them. I'll do it rhetorically with this crowd. And, and I ask them to ponder that. What, what if you could build exactly the workplace you wanted and you could describe the resulting workplace in just one word? What word would it be? And the words start flowing. They, they say things like productive, efficient, uh, capable, competent, uh, profitable. And then I pose to them, what if that word was joy? What if it was joyful? And I can tell you that takes a lot of business audiences by surprise. They don't expect joy to enter into the business context. Before I go any further in my presentation, I just want to show a brief video. Most organizations don't really spend much time thinking about their culture. Most organizations operate in chaos. Everyone wants to work on something that's bigger than themselves. I did. I started out in an industry that I was very excited about. Very quickly, I hit a trough of disillusionment. And by 1997, when I was promoted to vice president of product development, I wanted out. I wanted to get as far away from this industry as I could. And then in that moment, I decided to change the industry. And that's the story that I've captured in this book. People are coming from all over the planet to come visit this space that's in the basement of a parking structure in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. And they're coming for a reason. They're coming to see something. What most people are looking for is some lessons around what it takes to build an intentionally joyful culture. Imagine half of my team had joy and the other half didn't. Which half would you want working on your project? We had so many requests for these tours, we realized it was time to share this story with the world in a different way. And that's how the book came to be. The space is flexible. We work two to a computer, we assign these pairs, we switch them every five working days. 
the human energy that results from this kind of organization. You can actually feel the joy when you're in the room. My name is Richard Sheridan, and I'm the author of Joy, Inc. Why would I choose joy? Where did this come from for me? What was the, what was the sort of precipitating event in my life? And I can tell you that I fell in love with this profession when I was just 13 years old. I was just a little kid in high school then, and uh, uh, I had typed in a two-line program into a computer, and in that moment, I knew what I was going to do the rest of my days. I knew that this was a, uh, a dramatic uh, event in human history even, and I wanted to be a part of it. And for me, I could see the joy of creation, of imagination, of innovation coming out of the software industry. And uh, that, was my, uh, that was my ignition moment in my life. And I eventually came up to the University of Michigan, got a couple of degrees in computer science and computer engineering, and very quickly I, I hit this trough of disillusionment where uh, suddenly I was no longer operating in that joyful little kid environment uh, uh, where I could be creative, imaginative, and um, innovative and, and operate in a in an environment full of joy, I, I quickly moved into an environment of fear. I was spending time away from my family. I was operating in the death march of our industry. And I was, uh, I was concerned that perhaps I had actually chosen the wrong career. Maybe this wasn't the right thing for me. Maybe I didn't have what it took. And the organizations I was operating in were operating in chaos. Uh, chaos in the software industry is actually fairly easy to imagine. There's, you walk in the door in the morning and there's bugs awaiting you to be fixed. There's emergency phone calls coming in and the whole team feels like they're coming in in rubber coats and plastic visors and oxygen tanks in your back because we look like firefighters. Yet at the same time our processes are the equivalent of flicking cigarette butts everywhere and carrying sloshing gas cans and we wonder why there are fires going off everywhere in our organizations. And usually in that moment you suffer some big negative event and we've seen lots of those lately. Uh, we've seen them with big organizations and big projects like healthcare.gov. We've seen them inside of corporations like Target Corporation and others who've uh, had major security nightmares. And usually when that chaos occurs, when those chaotic events happen, there's a swing, a major corporate swing towards bureaucracy. So we go from the land of not being able to get anything done in chaos, we go to the land of not being able to get anything started in bureaucracy. And I can tell you there's a different approach, there's a different way of doing things than is customary. But ultimately for me, my disillusionment set in hard when the bosses I worked for would come for me and pull me inside their offices and tell me that the projects we'd been working on over the last several years where I was spending all this time away from my family ultimately got buried out in the backyard never to see the light of day. And I can tell you that there's nothing more disheartening for an engineering team to have projects that never see the light of day. When you've spent all this time imagining how it's going to be received by the world and then the project gets canceled. This was the environment that I was living in uh, for most of my career. But I can tell you that I'm I'm an eternal optimist. If you put me in a room full of manure, I will keep digging till I find the pony. And I was determined to dig my way out of this room full of manure. And my, my journey led me to books and it led me to authors. Uh, authors like Peter Senge's book, The Fifth Discipline, Tom Peter's book, In Search of Excellence, Peter Drucker's book on management. These were books that greatly influenced my thinking that there was in fact a better way than was customary to do what we were doing in my industry. And I was simply determined to find it. Those books weren't necessarily how-to books. They didn't tell me how to get there, but they at least painted a picture for me of what a potential future could look like. Eventually, I got promoted to vice president of product development for a tired old public company here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And along that journey of trying to dig my way out of the room full of manure, I discovered this book by a guy named Kent Beck called Extreme Programming Explained. I saw a video on an industrial design firm in California called IDEO, and I had what Franz Johansson calls in his book a click moment. Suddenly other, everything snapped into place, and I knew where I was going from there. 
And that's literally how Menlo came to be. In that moment, I decided I think I could change this industry. And that's where Menlo came from. So for the rest of this presentation, what I want to contemplate with your viewers is this. Is joy visible? Can you see it? Can you touch it? Does it matter? And does it have business value? Is there some purpose behind this? I think a lot of times in either the agile community of software development or the lean community of manufacturing, we sometimes lose sight of the goal. We, we think we're pursuing a certification. We think we're pursuing a methodology. What I want to try and convince your audience of today is if you're really honest with yourself, what you're pursuing is joy. And I can tell you a lot of people come to see it. We host tours here. Ron, you've been here on a tour. You've seen it. Last year, we had over 3,200 people come from all over planet Earth to come to this basement of a parking structure in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. And they're coming to see something. What I have said they're coming to see is some lessons around what it takes to build an intentionally joyful culture. I think a lot of people and, and uh, read books like I do, and they imagine a new uh, way of being, a new way of working, a new way of organizing their teams. And when they read these books, they're inspired. But somewhere along the way, they want to go to the Gemba. They, they want to go see a living, breathing example. And that's something we have here. For our history, we've opened our doors to the world to bring people in and show them how we do what we do, to let them dig their hands in the dirt of our culture, and to understand as much as they want to everything about what we do here. And when they come, I can tell you what they see first when they walk in the door. They see one of those vilified opus, open office environments that you hear about. You know, the ones that Fast Company magazine recently called a, an idea born in the mind of Satan in the deepest caverns of hell. Uh, everybody sends me these articles that declare that there's science, there's psychological data that declares that these big open environments don't work. And they send those articles to me. And they say, Rich, why does it work for Menlo and it doesn't seemingly work anywhere else? And I tell them it's quite simple. We didn't build an open and collaborative workspace. We built an open and collaborative culture and we fit our workspace to our culture. That's the important part. You can't take a bunch of people who don't like, know, or trust each other, jam them out in a big open room and expect them to get along. You have to focus on your culture first and then fit everything you do to that cultural intention. Contrary to popular belief about my industry, we embrace noise. There's a lot of people in my industry that would declare software development has to be done in library quiet. I can tell you a lot of executives invite me into their offices around the world now. They walk me into their sea of darkened cubicles and the conversation with them goes something like this. They whisper, they say, Rich, this is where our technical team works. They're thinking really deep thoughts right now. And we walk by these darkened cubicles and everyone has earbuds in their ears and they're silently clicking away on keyboards with screens that are turned away from the door. And then we get to the corner office and the executive says to me, now the first thing I want to talk to you about, Rich, is our communication challenges. What a surprise. Menlo is a noisy place but it's the noise of work, and that makes a huge difference. And much like the teams that Ron and I like, we happen to like opposing teams, actually. He's an Ohio State fan, and I'm a big Michigan fan. Um, he's been doing better than I have lately. Um, here, you can actually see the teamwork, just like you can see the teamwork on a weekend. Our team works shoulder to shoulder, unlike the typical office structure where the only way you can actually see a team is to look in an org chart. Here, you can actually see the team performing because they are sitting right next to one another, working together collaboratively. The space itself supports all of this. It's flexible. There's wires that pull down from the ceiling. There's lightweight aluminum tables. So the team can change the space however they choose. And this is critically important to our culture. You see, there are no space police here. There's no facilities person. There's no permission you have to go ask. If the team wants to change the space, they just change it. I don't know how much of the behind the scenes you can see of me through the cameras, but the space could very well be changing behind me while we're speaking here together. 
The space changes in little ways every single day as a team adjusts to different project needs and different teamwork combinations that they need. And then every once in a while it just changes in a big way for fun. Team gets bored with the old setup, tears everything down, pulls it apart, puts it back together in an evening and the next morning you walk in and everything has moved. That exhilarates them, that excites them, that actually excites me. I sit out in the room with everybody else. I just have the same five foot table as everyone else. There's no gifted C-suite here for the, for the CEO. And of course, much like the lean community likes to espouse, and we certainly are right there with them, our space is very visual. We use the wall boards for everything. We, we're push pinning things into the wall. All the important artifacts are out in the, out in the room for everyone to see. And that's an incredibly important part of our culture. And we built that learning organization that Peter Senge described in the fifth discipline. We knew that we had to have an organization that had to be learning every minute of every day. If we weren't learning every minute of every day, we were falling behind. Heck, even when we are learning every minute of every day, we're falling behind. And so there are a lot of books here. But books comprise only a small, small piece of our learning system. The real learning comes in how we organize the people, how we organize our processes. You see, we put two heads together all day long. We work two to a computer. So we connect our team intellectually. In, intellectually. We connect them emotionally so they get to build a trusting relationship with one another. We connect them physically at this computer and they share that computer keyboard and mouse back and forth all day long. These pairs are assigned and we switch them every five working days. So you get this human energy because people have to exchange information with one another. They have to catch each other up. And so the transfer of knowledge is happening all the time. One of the biggest challenges in our industry is what I call the tower of knowledge problem, where there's the one person on your team who knows everything about a particular system and no one else knows what they know. This is a huge problem for my industry because it prevents scaling. It prevents scaling both up and down. And you end up with overworked teams that are working through the nights and the weekends to try and accomplish something. And tired programmers make big mistakes, costly mistakes, mistakes we can no longer afford either in our companies or quite frankly in our societies. Back in 1982, I read a book by John Nesbitt called Megatrends. And this is one of my favorite quotes from that book, that the most exciting breakthroughs of this, of this century, the one we're in now, the 21st century, will not occur because of technology, but because of an expanding concept of what it means to be human. And we see this everywhere, don't we? We're in coffee shops or restaurants or uh, even sporting events, and people aren't connecting to each other. They're not connecting to people. They're connecting to their devices. And that separates us. It doesn't draw us together. What we realized in the, in the tribes of technology, and there's three distinct tribes in technology. There's, there's the tribe that pays money to have technology built. There's the tribe that actually builds the technology. And then there's a lost tribe, the one you find in the Amazonian forest, um, the, the, the users, the ones no one ever talks to. Um, we found that the most exciting breakthroughs, the most exciting innovations that could occur in software development processes are in the conversations between those tribes. Conversations, rituals, artifacts. How do, we, how do we exchange information between these groups? One of the central ways we do this here at Menlo is within the tribe itself. The conversations we have with one another. We jokingly refer to our internal communication system because it doesn't use electronics, it doesn't use email, it doesn't use texting. We refer to it as high-speed voice technology. Wonderfully, the hardware is pre-installed at birth. You have vocal cords and tympanic membranes and auditory nerve stimulation of the brain. It's supported by body language, eyebrows, and tonal inflection. It's very high fidelity. In fact, at Menlo, when we want to call an all-company meeting, and anybody who visits can do this, you just call out, hey, Menlo. And if it was me saying it, they'd call back and say, hey, Rich, and the whole place would go quiet, and they'd wait for me to say something. Nobody moves. In the spirit of lean, people like to talk about eliminating the waste of excessive motion. Well, imagine you could have an all-company meeting where no one had to go to a conference room. No one had to look at their calendars. People simply had to turn their heads, 
focus their eyes on whoever said, hey Menlo, and now you're in an all company meeting. Our all company meetings usually last a few seconds and then they're done, you say thank you and they go back to work. We hate meetings here, we've pretty much eliminated them. We think they're mind numbing, spirit sucking, energy draining devices of management. In the Q&A section you can ask me later, later how I really feel about them. We do have one meeting a day though. Intriguingly, because of our whimsical irreverence, uh, this meeting is called by a dartboard that has an alarm clock in it. Why a dartboard needs an alarm clock, I have no idea, but ours is programmed to go off at 10 o'clock. And at 10 o'clock every morning, this bong, bong, bong sound goes off, and everyone in the room gathers in a circle. And we have our daily stand-up meeting. And I do mean everyone comes, including the dogs. They know they're going to be taken out for a walk right after stand-up, so they're excited about stand-up. And then we grab the token that controls the meeting. The iconic symbol of Menlo now is the $7 plastic Viking helmet from USToys.com. How's that for whimsical irreverence? And we like the Viking helmet because we work in pairs and we report out in pairs, so having a two-handled token actually facilitates this report out. And so. Here's a couple of our QA folks, Tracy and Joe, reporting out on something they're working on. Two of our programmers, Nate and Katie, talking about some of the programming efforts they're doing. Two of our high-tech anthropologists, I'll introduce that concept a little later, talking about some design assessments they're working on. This token moves around the room. There might be 50 or 60 people in this daily stand-up meeting. And intriguingly, everyone gets a chance to report out and the meeting typically takes 13 minutes. I defy most organizations to begin a meeting of 60 people in 13 minutes, let alone call it, assemble it, hold it, complete it, and everyone get back to work in 13 minutes. The other innovation is between us and our customers, between us and our business sponsors, how do we facilitate that conversation? And this is where we go back to good, good old fashioned kindergarten skills. We go back to show and tell. We invite our clients into the room every fifth day of a project. They come in, they visit with us. They see what progress we've made. And when we're far into the project, they actually show us the work we've done the previous five days. We don't show it to them. They sit front and center. They sit at the keyboard and the mouse, and they show us the work that we did the previous five days. This brings them back into the conversation. Again, back to that Nesbitt trend, uh, Megatrends book. How do we innovate to increase the communication, to increase the understanding of what it means to be a human being? And in this particular case, what we realized was we need the customer's hands on the product as we're developing it. If we're simply showing it to them, they disengage. Now my whole team watches, the team that worked on that particular client's project watches while the client shows us the work. We don't send an emissary, we don't send a, uh, uh, someone who's going to later come back and give us a managerial interpretive dance of what did the customer think about the results. I want the team to feel the raw emotion from the customer, whether good or bad. The customer might look at something we've done and say, oh, I'm sorry, is that what you thought I meant? That's not what I meant at all. Our answer then is awesome. We made a mistake faster. It's a core part of our culture here. We want to make mistakes faster not because we're, we thrive on making mistakes, we thrive on making them quickly so we can correct them while they're still small. Show and tell gives us a, one chance to do that. And then we have this system that people have dubbed us the Amish of software development because we plan with little folded pieces of paper on a flat table. The customer comes in and reviews the various work items that might be included in their project. We don't know if they can be included because we don't know if they fit in their time frame and their budget yet. They have to choose them and they choose them by picking them up off the table and laying them down in these colorful planning sheets that have a box inscribed on them that very exactly determines their time frame and their budget. And as they pick up these cards, they start consuming the real estate of those planning sheets. They start consuming the real estate of the time frame they're working in and the budget that we're constrained by. Nothing ever gets done without constraints. We just make the constraints obvious. And as we go through this practice, we get to the point where nothing, it, it, it fills up and not all of it fits. I often uh, joke with people who are on tours here that 
when they come in, I ask them if they have in their meetings ever had a boss say something like, now we're all on the same page, right? And uh, I want them to go back to those bosses in those meetings and say, so which page are we talking about, boss? Are we talking about the whiteboard, the flip chart, the notebook? Here at Menlo, when we put those planning pieces on those pieces of paper, we are all on the same page because there's only one page to look at. And then the pieces of paper that are still on the table are the things we've decided not to do. Maybe not never. Maybe not yet. We just don't know. But right now, they don't fit in the current plan, so they stay on the table. We love the fact that this eliminates the ambiguity of knowing what we've decided to do and what we've decided not to do. Our customers get very invested in these artifacts. They're simple, handwritten artifacts that allow for collaboration. Our tools, while seemingly simple, invite collaboration, invite participation because they're not complicated to learn. And they're all supported by one of our keystone habits that no work can get done in our place unless it's first handwritten down on a five and a half inch by eight and a half inch index card. I know this is all crazy sounding to people who expect that a software company would use software for all of these things. But we decided long ago that we were going to choose tools we believed work better for humans. And if it's a low tech answer that works better for humans, that's what we're going to choose. After the work plans are set by the customer and they know what we're going to work on as an entire company, we put those individual items up on a wallboard display under people's names so everyone knows exactly what piece is assigned to them. These cards are placed next to the day that we expect them to complete based on the estimates that came from the people doing the work. They're put in a column under the names of the people so they know what order they should be working on things and they're always put in a five-day cycle here. Everything here works in a five-day cycle. We chart progress with little colorful sticky dots that are put on these index cards as progress is made. A yellow dot indicates that that's the card that's active. That's the one that that pair of people is working on. When they think they're done, they put an orange dot on the card. Maybe some of you have worked with programmers somewhere in your past. I spent the first 20 years of my life coding, 20 years of my professional life coding. And uh, I can tell you that programmers have as many different definitions for done as Eskimos have words for snow. You know, you'll hear things like, well, it's done, but it's not finished, or it's done, but it's not done done. And QA's favorite term, favorite phrase from the team, favorite, and I mean that in a very sarcastic manner, is when the programmer says, well, it worked on my machine. Well, here, it's not possible for the programmers to be done and not having it work. So when the orange dot goes on, they've gone through a very explicit set of procedures to get to this part where they think they're done. Then QA comes and checks their work, and if QA likes what they see, the programming card gets a green dot. QA doesn't like what they see, the programming card gets a red dot with an explanation, and the programmers are back to work on it. The last innovation I want to talk about in our conversation, rituals, ceremonies, and artifacts piece of the conversation is how do we communicate with that lost tribe I spoke about earlier? You know, we may be the only industry on the planet that has gotten away for our entire history calling the people we serve stupid. You've heard the term, maybe you've even said it about yourself. I'm, a, I'm just a stupid user or, oh, those stupid users just won't get this. Then we go and write dummies books for those poor people. Well, it doesn't have to be that way. I can tell you if you take a different approach, you can actually design software that delights. And this, quite frankly, gets to the heart of the definition of joy that we use here at Menlo. A lot of people come in and they say, oh, you're about being happy. Well, sure, there's happiness from time to time here, but this is really hard work. We're not happy every minute of every day. And they're like, oh, so you're about creating joy in some fashion or another inside the room. Well, yeah, I don't think you can produce joyful outcomes without joy inside the room. But understand, the joy here at Menlo is externally focused. It's about the effect we're trying to have on the world. You see, back to those early youthful, exuberant days, and then to my trough of disillusionment days, there's one thing that delights a technical team like mine. It's that their work gets out into the world and delights the people for whom it's intended. Someday later, somebody stops us on the sidewalk and says, I love that software. You guys made my life better. 
That's what we seek. And the way we do that, the way we get to that, is through anthropology. We have a set of people on our team that are called high-tech anthropologists. It's a very cool title. It's fun to carry around on your business card. Uh, it causes a lot of fun conversations at parties. But they literally apply the methods of an anthropologist by going out into the world and studying people in their native environment. We don't go ask people how we want the software to work. We don't go get gather requirements documents that we can later hide behind and say, well, that's what you told us to do. No, we go out into the world and discover these people, their goals as human beings. We empathically seek to design user experiences that delight them, not confound them, not make them feel stupid. Our anthropologists use a lot of different paper-based tools themselves. This is a persona map that you can see here in this picture, which directly uh, focuses the attention of our design practices on a particular type of person, the one in the center of the persona map. That's our primary persona. That's the person we're going to serve more than anyone else. And by using this kind of device, we can start to sort through all the design decisions we make, not based on personal intuition or design genius, but rather thinking about the people we're trying to serve. If we're trying to serve someone else, we need to make sure we serve them in a way that doesn't interfere with that primary person's use of the software. Our anthropologists are ambiguity machines. They, they gather all this ambiguous information from the world and use all the techniques you can imagine around mind mapping and brainstorming. And in this picture, you can see we're probably 3M Corporation's favorite kind of customer. Uh, we use all kinds of synthesizing types of methods in order to filter out this ambiguity and get it down to a crystal clear screen design. Our anthropologists start out in the cloud of ambiguity, but by the time they get done and hand things off to our programmers, they have pixel perfect screen designs and sequences for our programmers to turn into solid working software. I want to end this presentation with a story. And it's a story about getting to a better kind of culture. Now, you're going to think the story is about dogs and babies, and in fact, it is about dogs and babies. But if that's the point you take away, you will have missed the bigger lesson in all of this. All of us as leaders need to learn to fight fear. And I don't mean our own fear. I mean fight using fear to motivate our team. We have to do this within the context of embracing change because the world is changing so rapidly that if we're not embracing change, we're falling behind. The way we do it here at Menlo is we run experiments, experiments after experiments after experiments. It's probably the most common phrase you will hear is, let's run the experiment. Let me tell you about one of those famous experiments here to see how this plays out. Eight years ago, Tracy had little Maggie she had taken three months off for maternity leave, and then she was ready to come back to work. She came to me and said, Rich, I'm so excited to be back to work. I can't wait to get back in the office, but little Maggie doesn't have a daycare option right at the moment. The daycare we're planning on using is full, and the grandparents live too far away to help. I don't know what to do. Now, I can tell you in this moment, I had two voices screaming in my ear. Tracy never heard them. I had the bright voice on my right shoulder and the dark voice on my left. And the dark voice said, don't you dare say what you're about to say. HR will kill you. The lawyers will freak out. The insurance premiums will probably go through the roof. And the bright voice said, you love kids. You don't even have an HR department. Run the experiment. So I looked at Tracy and I said, bring her into work. Now, the look of bewilderment on her face was uh, something I wish I had captured in a photograph. She said, what do you mean? I said, bring her into the office. She said, all day? And I said, sure, why not? She said, every day? I said, yeah. And then she started questioning my sanity, how much I'd thought this through, which, quite frankly, I hadn't thought it through very much. And she said, Rich, what if she makes a fuss? I said, here, it's like a noisy restaurant. You'll never hear her. She said, well, where will I put her? I said. She's not going anywhere. She's three months old. Put her on the floor in a bassinet wherever you're working. She said, but what if she really makes a screaming fit kind of fuss? One that would disrupt the whole team. I said, Tracy, you're the mom. I trust you. You'll do the right thing. Let's run the experiment. 
and adjust. We'll see what happens. Let's not defeat the idea before we get started. Now you've been hearing this story while staring at this beauty, beautiful little baby that's on the screen here and you're thinking, boy, Maggie sure is cute. The thing is, that's not Maggie, that's Ellie. Ellie is Menlo baby number eight in the last eight years. To say this was a successful experiment would be probably the understatement of our history. We love having the kids in the office. We have four babies in process right now here at Menlo. This has been a wonderful experiment. Ellie learned to pair program. Ellie went to design meetings with her mom. Henry came back to visit just to check on us, see how we were doing. We discovered a couple of things when you run these experiments, and this is something I want you to take away from this presentation is, when we were taught experimentation in high school, we ran existing experiments that we had known outcomes for. I would declare to you that is not the way to teach experimentation because you run experiments to discover something, not to prove that you can do it again and again the way it was done the first time. So you should expect the unexpected. Well, we did have unexpected results with that first baby. When Maggie fussed like a baby can, and it was to the level of noise it was disruptive, we found out it was seldom Tracy that had to go rescue the baby. The team would rush to pick up little Maggie. The team raised the child. Little Maggie's probably one of the more socialized babies in her school at this point. And then we discovered something even greater. Customers behave better when you bring a baby to the meeting. They don't raise their voice, they don't swear at you, they think you're an amazingly a uh, thoughtful culture to allow parents to bring babies into the room and they lament that they can't do the same where they work. So these have been delightful discoveries along the way inside of this experiment. Here's little Henry with his dad. If that isn't a picture of joy, I don't know what is. Here's Henry going around learning how to manage. He's asking people, hey, how's it going? What you working on? We've always had dogs in our office since our beginning. It's something we've embraced, it's worked. And one time, the customer sitting here in the orange shirt was coming in for show and tell with Laura and Megan, two of our high-tech anthropologists. He called up ahead of time and he said, hey, do you mind if I bring Buster with me to the meeting? And we said, sure, who's Buster? And he said, my Great Dane. And he brought his Great Dane into the office. Buster's awesome, he's taller than me and I'm a pretty tall guy. As I reflected on a customer bringing his own dog into our office, especially a big one like this, I thought, wow, how cool that our customer chose to participate in our culture, that they wanted to be like us, that they felt comfortable participating in, well, in the ways of Menlo. This particular gentleman, Mike, couldn't bring Buster into where he works. It actually wouldn't be appropriate, given the kind of work he does in his office. But he decided when he was coming to Menlo, he was going to bring his dog. He wanted to be like us. We've seen a lot of customers begin to change their ways just by virtue of their interactions with us. That's a pretty cool place for a culture to be. There's no question inside of all of this that there also has to be rigor and discipline. This is one very serious team that uses all the latest tools and methods they can to build the highest quality software they can. The rigor and discipline that exists here is unprecedented in my career. Ultimately, all of this has to do with that joy I talked about at the beginning. How do we create an environment, a space, a process, a methodology to produce the kind of joyful outcomes that we seek? Solid working software, getting out into the world, delighting the people for whom it's intended, and having people return to us later and say, I love that software. That was everything I wanted as a kid, and it's everything I've been able to achieve now that we're back here at Menlo. 14 years in. Ultimately required that we built a learning organization. As Peter Senge described it, in the long run, the only sustainable source of competitive advantage is your organization's ability to learn faster than your competition. I don't know if we're always faster than our competition, but what I know is we have built learning right into our system here. I am happy to take questions for the rest of the time we have together today. You can see there's a lot of ways to contact us here. There's ways to buy the book. And we created a special landing page just for you guys. 
that's listed up at the top where you can download a free chapter of the book. You can explore the possibility of taking tours or perhaps even get copies of these slides. So I'll stop there, Ron. I'll let you take it from here to see how we want to facilitate questions. And again, I'm delighted and humbled that you would invite me to speak with you here today. No, thank you, Richard. It was fantastic. I just have to show off to everybody. This is my copy of the book that Richard signed. So thank you for that, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I call very, author joy, Ron. <laughs> yes, this is a very, very good book. So, and I'm, just, I'm not just saying that because you're on the webinar. So we've got a lot of questions here, Richard. So what we're going to do, folks, is we're going to do our best to get through as many as we can. And uh, uh, I'm not sure we're going to, uh, thank you, Kim. She said, what a fantastic webinar. So, um, and oh gosh, it's blowing up with, uh, how fantastic you are, Richard. So thank you, thank you all. <laughs> thank you. So, yes. Um, all right. Well, let's let's just get into some questions here. So, um, we've got several that are kind of uh, kind of related. Um, one I'll just summarize from uh, Elisa. I, I believe that's how you say then her name is um, from Twitter, and just kind of a general to the point question, which I'm sure you'll appreciate is how much does this, this joy cost? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great question. Uh, you know, how can we afford all this joy around here? Um, yes. You know, obviously, uh, if, if we couldn't stay in business, if we couldn't stay profitable, joy would be a fairly empty and hollow and short pursuit. Um, you know, the fact of the matter is that um, if you think about the downward spiral of chaos and the negative events that are caused by this, you end up delivering less than quality products to the world. You begin to get a bad reputation in the marketplace. Your customers begin fleeing to your competitors. Your staff becomes demoralized because they're delivering substandard work to the world that people complain about every chance they get. So uh, I've certainly personally convinced myself that um, uh, there is no alternative of higher business value than pursuing joy and, uh, and we're very confident in the way we've chosen to pursue that. I have some very direct head-to-head -head comparisons of projects that we competed on for years against other companies that outspent us 10 to 1 trying to produce the exact same effect and we beat them in the marketplace and beat them handily in the marketplace. And so uh, you, don't, you don't often get those chances. We've had those. We've seen the direct comparisons. We've seen the numbers. And um, it's stunning. Fantastic. All right, so I've got a, a fastball here for you, OK? They're not all going to be softballs. <laughs> so uh, Cam um, is states first, very nice, but not sure there's anything we can take away from this as we don't design our office environment most of us are just workers. <laughs> well, what do you have to say? Yeah, about? well, there's no question that um, <laughs> there is a role for leadership to play in producing an environment of joy. Uh, I don't believe you can ever accomplish any transformational change inside of an organization as simply a grassroots movement. There must be leadership, there must be vision at the top that supports that. Uh, when I get pulled into companies and ask me, Rich, how would we get from where we are today to where we want to go? I tell them, first of all, seek the highest ground possible you can in your organization. You must have a heat shield somewhere above you. If you can't get to that, you probably won't be able to get to any kind of transformational change that looks anything like what we have here. Hmm. Very good. Um, so we've got several questions that are, I guess, kind of related to what you just said. Uh, Bruce uh, is asking, and, and another uh, person asked earlier, uh, just about how to how to go about approaching, say, a CEO of an organization um, about this concept. And you know, perhaps they're just a very traditional organization. Um, what what advice do you have for those folks? Yeah, I actually. Uh, it I'm going to remind the uh, audience, uh, I don't think I was very clear on this in the beginning, that part of my personal history was when I was at VP at that tired old public company, I transformed that organization to something that looks like Menlo today over a two-year period. So I've done this in the context of an existing tired old public company. And I had to convince my CEO at the time, Bob Nero, of that change. 
and I actually tell the story in the book. I'll tell a little bit of it here. Uh, the thing that, I, that dawned on me as I was trying to describe what I was trying to accomplish is the, the biggest thing I needed to learn to do was speak in Bob's language. I had to speak in the language of the CEO to affect this change. At first, I was just describing the technical things I wanted to accomplish. I, I, I'd use my, my version of mumbo jumbo and geek speak and all that sort of thing, and Bob wasn't buying it. He, didn't, he wasn't budging. He's a good guy, and he was very supportive of my enthusiasm and my energy, but he couldn't see the business value for what I was trying to accomplish. Eventually, when I learned to speak to him in terms that he understood, words that he could take to his board as a public company and even a couple of major stockholders, that's when I started to break through. That's mm. when Bob became my biggest supporter, and he never varied from that after that happened. Mm. Mm. Okay, very good. Got several questions. Um, one young lady lives in Detroit, says uh, they're new on, the, uh, just starting on their lean journey, and several other folks are just wanting more details about how to come visit you. It's trivial. Uh, you simply write um, a, an email to experience at menloinnovations.com. And that simple email saying, hey, I'd like to hear about taking a tour. I just heard this talk by Rich, uh, and we are going to take great care of you. We, we do one to three tours a day now, and uh, we hosted over 3,000 people here last year. Hmm. Wow, fantastic. All right. Um, several questions are related um, around the concept of um, where we don't build software, or we don't design software, we're a traditional kind of manufacturing yep. company and so forth. What can we take from, uh, from Menlo? So the first thing, the first general thing I want you to take away from this isn't that you should make your organization look like mine. You know, that, that would be silly. That would be actually arrogant on my part to believe that the way we've crafted Menlo is the way every company should perfectly be crafted, that somehow we've solved the general puzzle for how to put together human organizations. The one thing I will encourage you towards is adopt a culture of experimentation when you get done with this webinar, or you read my book or the books of others, or you go to a conference, often you come away with some inspirational ideas. You've got this seed of an idea that's like hovering around in your belly and it just can't wait to get out. And you meet the first person you, you run into at work the next morning and you grab them and you say, hey, Ron, I got this idea from this talk I heard yesterday. And I tell it to Ron and the first thing Ron says to me is, well, that won't work here. We're not that kind of company. We're, you know, that's, that's, not, that's not according to policy here. And, and then the idea dies right in that moment. We've all experienced that. I know I had. Here, and what I would encourage you to do, is take away one simple phrase, and that is this. Look them in the eye and say, yeah, I know, Ron, but let's run the experiment. Before we defeat this, let's try it and see what happens. And then based on what happens, we'll adjust or will kill the idea, but let's not kill the idea without trying something. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, um, uh, Richard is asking, it's a, a long question, so I'll summarize it here a bit. Uh, how much change is too much, too fast, and what is a good tool to gauge you know, the, the, the results of the change? Yeah, I, I strive a lot for human energy. Uh, I think if you throw too many things at people, they, they become a little bit, um, you know, uh, distracted and, and preoccupied with the change itself. We've got a poster here at Menlo that I think everybody can relate to. It says, people don't resist change, they resist being changed. And so as leaders, we have to draw people to the change. We have to make sure we're clearly communicating. And what I would suggest to everyone is, as I had to, look externally from your organization, figure out what is your why, as Simon Sinek would say, and start with why. What is your purpose? What kind of joy are you trying to bring into the world? And what processes and procedures and practices should we be using to get to that external joy? Because if we start focusing externally, then it come, becomes less about me. The other thing I can tell you is there may be people in this crowd that heard me speak today or others who watch this afterwards who who say to themselves, you go, Rich, you tell those people, they need to change. And the first thing I would say is, no, you need to change. I needed to change. I had to become a different kind of leader. I had to become a different kind of uh, visionary for my company. I had to let go of some things that were, quite frankly, trained into me by my 
mimicry of managerial mentors that had led me to this point uh, in my life. So I had been drawn into the same system that I was now trying to change. So the first thing I had to do was break free of that myself. So I would first look internally at change. I would become a student again, if you aren't already, but I'm guessing anybody who's attending these kind of things is heavily in student mode. I know you gather a great crowd around you, Ron. Read books again. You know, become voracious uh, in your reading. Uh, get inspired by these, and then, as I say, begin running these experiments. Small ones first. You don't have to boil the ocean tomorrow. Understand, you're on a long journey. This is a this is a journey of, of lengthy change. Uh, if, if anybody came here today saying, I think in the next hour, I'm going to get the three ideas that will make change in my 100-year-old company trivial, and I think we'll be done by next week, sorry to disappoint. This is a new journey for you, a journey that has to start with a step, but a journey indeed, and one that I believe is well worth it. OK, um, so we've got a, a few. Uh, questions on, on how your folks work. So kind of talking about the pairing mm -hmm. concept now, um, uh, Shul um, asked on, on Twitter, what happens when two colleagues refuse to work together? <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. people often ask us that. They say, so what do you do when two people don't get along? And of course, I, I turn the question right back around to them. I say, so what do you do when two people don't get along? Because you see here at Menlo, if two people aren't getting along, guess what? We find out about it right away. You know, if they're just sitting there with their arms across their chest and they're not looking at each other and they're quiet and they're just stewing in their own juices, we're pretty sure they're not getting along right now. In a typical corporate environment, we might be passively, aggressively fighting by email and not getting anything done for months on end and nobody's seeing that because it all looks like we're just clicking away on keyboards and we're actually working when we're sending nasty emails to one another. So we find out right away. Now, I can tell you that doesn't happen much here because we pre-program our culture right into our interviewing and hiring practices. We kind of sort through the people who aren't going to get along. Now, is somebody going to have a bad day? Is somebody going to say the wrong thing and get somebody upset? Of course they are. It's one of the reasons some of our most common books here are books about interpersonal communication, books like Crucial Conversations and Crucial Confrontations from Vital Smarts, or Leadership and Self-Deception and the Anatomy of Peace from the Arbinger Institute. These are some of our favorite books because they teach us how to have better interpersonal communications so when we are struggling, we can actually work on it. Israel had a question early on. Um, could you want us to know if you could explain a little more the slide of Embrace the Noise? Ah, yes. Yeah, a lot of people think that uh, software <coughs> development needs uh, library quiet. Um, but what we're counting on is the same thing Edison was counting on in his Menlo Park, New Jersey lab, counting on the serendipity of overhearing the ideas of others, using that as a springboard for creativity, imagination, energy, innovation, invention. And so when we shut off the outside world, when we put earbuds in our ears and we silently click away on keyboards, we've shut off any possibility of that. Now a lot of people think, well, then you must be distracted all day long. Well, not really. All of us have experienced this. Because we're working in pairs, and I believe that's a pretty important part of our practice here, but think of the last time you were in a noisy coffee shop having a personal, important conversation with someone you care about. You could have that conversation with that other person undistracted by all the noise going around you until suddenly you heard someone from across the room call your name and you turned your head to look at them to see who it was that had come in that knew you and wanted to talk with you. And you realized, oh, in that moment, maybe they weren't actually asking for you. But your brain is tuned to certain things. What we've discovered here at Menlo is that the brain is an amazing filter. The team self-reports that it takes about three weeks for that filter to kick in and eventually your brain just quiets down the outside noise. It is in fact white noise. We actually get bothered here at Menlo when the room gets too quiet. Mm. And, uh, and I think that's the case for a lot of people. When you're in that sea of darkened cubicles and there's some guy talking on his cell phone about the football game coming up this weekend, that bothers everybody because it's the only noise in the room. Here our noise is the noise of work. It's the noise of focused attention on the task at hand. Very good. All right, let's go ahead and do one last question, Rich. This one comes from Sarah, and uh, she asked, can you give an example of when an experiment failed 
and how you managed it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think it's the weird entrepreneurial part of my brain, Ron, is I don't remember those. Um, <laughs> I, that's that, ex, in, uh, it's that uh, insatiable optimism I have. Um, Trying to think, uh, let's see. You know, the fact of the matter is when, when experiments fail, and they do, I, I don't even mean to, I, I'm not trying to imply we don't have failed experiments here. We tend to just start adjusting them or abandon them so quickly we don't think about them. In fact, we sort of hope the failure rate on experiments is about 50%, because if it's not 50%, then fear has crept too much into the room and we're started, stopping trying things. Um, we've been trying for a few years now to get to a a systematic approach that we use all the time for open book finances to put our money things uh, all the things related to running the finances of the business up on the wall for all to see we keep trying new things and new ways of doing that and it never sticks uh, we're, we're committed to the idea top to bottom left to right uh, but we've yet to find the experiment that actually makes this part of our a systematic part of our culture mm. Very good. Um, Richard, um, I love speaking to you. The, the, I have one last question for you. It is, when can we expect to see a version of this as a TED Talk? Because I really <laughs> think it should be. And I, and I mean it. I am not joking. Your lips to God's ears, Ron. <laughs> I've done TEDx talks, but I've never gotten to the, uh, to the game, as it were. All right. Well, let's get you there. You, you need to be. Thanks. <laughs> so, Rich, thanks again, and uh, we'll, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much, Ron.